Welcome to In the Spotlight with your host, Bravo Barisha. Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm your host, Bravo Barisha. Today we have a special guest, my first academic advisor here at Benedictine University, current academic advisor to Benue students, and overall wonderful member of the Benedictine community, Brittany Dvorak. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, so before we talk about uh, your work here at Benedictine um, and your education, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and where you grew up. Well, I grew up in uh, Bolingbrook uh, until about high school, and then I moved a uh, whopping 20 miles to Plainfield, so 20 mile radius my entire life until I went to school at ISU, so. Okay, yeah, so um, grew up in the suburbs, and mm -hmm. then you decided to go to Normal, Illinois, to attend Illinois State University. Um, there you majored in communications with a concentration in leadership. So um, why did you decide to go to ISU? Originally, I was going for education. I thought I wanted to be a teacher my entire life. And then when I went into my first classes, I realized I don't know if that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I talked with my academic advisor, and I realized that communication was my passion and kind of going into that leadership um, role and working with students. Yeah, absolutely. What about uh, communications drew you in initially? I liked that it was a broad major and you, I could do multiple different areas with it and kind of be able to see where I can go with it. Absolutely. And then um, from ISU, you decided to go to, um, well, in terms of education, you decided to go to NCC, North Central College. Um, what drew you to go from a big school like ISU to a private school like NCC? Well, I got my master's after I started working. Uh, I wanted to pay off some college debt first before I added on more debt. Uh, so I was working and it was more so the location uh, just because I worked full time and went to school full time. Okay. Yeah, so um, at NCC, uh, you, like you mentioned, you majored in uh, leadership um, with a concentration in higher education. So lots of leadership. Initially, you had mm -hmm. a concentration in leadership, then you majored in leadership. Um, were you always a leader growing up? or? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I tend to take the lead on projects and things like that, but I can also be the follower as well. So I think it, it was just a passion and leadership, I think, is everything someone should have to try and go into different areas uh, within their career or just with friends. Um, I think it's definitely something that a lot of people should try and strive for, especially within the working world, to try and have some leadership underneath them, um, whether it be internships, different things like that. Okay, and then... Um so uh, from, N from NCC, um, obviously you initially started at Benedictine working as an uh, admissions coordinator and working in admissions, excuse me, and as an, an events coordinator. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that. So I planned all of the admissions events, so for undergraduates as well as graduate students. Uh, so any events that a prospective student would, would come to, so like follow-up in houses, orientations, um, all the tour guides on campus were underneath me as well. So I worked um, and planned all of those events and helped with the tours on campus. How would you say um, your majors in communication and leadership uh, aided you in, in, in doing that? I would say that by ha being able to coordinate all those uh, events, you definitely have to work with multiple different departments as well as trying to uh, work with all the student workers as well too. I had about 80 students under uh, working for me. So trying to coordinate all of that and trying to be that leader and making sure that they're getting everything that they want out of that job and also kind of utilizing their skills and assets within the job to kind of help even maybe decide a major or um, kind of help them just within that job um, and kind of branch out a little bit too. Excellent. Well, um, that's all we have time for right now. When we return, we'll talk to Brittany some more about her work at Benue. Welcome to Ben News for December. I'm Zachary Dunn. And I'm Zakira Majed. Here are this month's top stories. An anonymous donor donated a windmill to Benedictine University. Eye of the Eagles' Rob Eber was able to meet with Benedictine's very own Jean Marie Kauf to discuss the gift that was presented to the university. This is Rob Eber from Eye of the Eagle here with uh, Dr. Jean Marie Kauf. How are you today? Good. So it's to my understanding that an anonymous donor donated a uh, windmill to the university. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about that? Yes, I really don't know who donated it, um, but we want to thank them. It's, it's got great symbolic value, educational va value on top of contributing to offsetting our carbon footprint at the university. And uh, yeah, it's going to be installed on the garage 
and the the elevator tower. And my understanding is, that, you know, all the approvals are in place, the electricity is in place, but they have to wait for the cement to be poured. It has to be a certain temperature um, to pour that cement. Okay. Awesome. Now you said it's going to be on the. Uh, you said it's going to be in the parking garage then. Yes, mounted on the elevator tower. Um, awesome. Now, do you know what the um, what it, what the windmill is going to power? If it if it, what it, what exactly the power is going to be going to, or uh, you know how much it's going to give? It's a uh, one kilowatt uh, windmill, and my understanding is it's going to go to the garage, and uh, you know that's not enough to power the whole campus, of course. But um, yes, it's it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. Now, do we know if the uh, the donor was able to choose? Um, the windmill or was that the university's decision and he just donated the money or do you would you happen to know that I don't know you know I think that you know there's only so much windmill you can buy for that amount of money um, there are different models um, so I'm not sure if the donor had a role in that but I thank them absolutely yeah if the donor happens to be watching this thank you very much uh, on behalf of the university um, once again this is Rob Eber from Isle Eagle here with Dr. Jean Marie Cow. thank you again for your time thanks Rob thank you awesome perfect that's fine. You say your name, you say Rob Eber. Yeah. But it sounds like Robbie. In early November, a discussion panel was held, bringing awareness to the problem of toxic masculinity. The panel consisted of three members from the university, a student, a professor, and a police officer, all of whom answered questions and even shared their own personal experiences with toxic masculinity. Once each of the panelists were done sharing their thoughts, the audience was given the opportunity to share theirs. I have the Eagle reporter Andrew Brown spoke with philosophy professor Stephen Burgess, a panelist at the event. Hi, I'm Andrew Brown. I'm here with I have the Eagle. Today I'm here with Professor Burgess, who recently held a panel on toxic, toxic masculinity. Would you mind telling us a little bit about what exactly toxic masculinity is? Sure. Uh, toxic masculinity is a set of ideals in society um, concerning what it means to be a man and uh, everybody knows the kinds of expectations that come along with being a man or being a woman or being a person of any gender. Um, and the toxic aspect comes in from um, certain ideals that happen to be um, violent or aggressive or perceiving others without care or perceiving others more like objects. Um, and so certain ways of behaving that are expected of, of males um, tend to be toxic because they produce people to be violent and uncaring toward others. Mm -hmm. um, and usually this has to do with um, misogyny, sexism, patriarchy, okay. et cetera. Nice. And who else was a part of that panel and how did their perspectives lead to a good discussion? Yeah, we had uh, three panelists. We had uh, student Anthony Miller. Um, he's a recent transfer. Um, and he's extremely interested in, in ideas of, of masculinity studies and um, determining how ideals like the ones I was just speaking of contribute to um, sexual assault, domestic violence, and, and other such things. And he's passionate about it, and he really thinks back to his own experience. You know, he, he, was, he was very open when we first met about his own experiences of, of what it's like to be a man and what, what other people expect of him. And so he's, he's very passionate about it. And we also have, of course, uh, the police chief, Derek Ferguson, on campus. And he's someone who's been working actively to combat um, trends of toxic masculinity. OK, and is there any advice that you could give students to stray away or how to stray away from this toxic masculinity? Um, well, I think the, the best thing is just to be aware of the ways that we're acting. I always think of it in terms of like the hidden norms that shape us, that, that make us act in certain ways without our really even being aware that, that we're doing it. Um, and so take a step back every once in a while and try to reflect and think about like, why did I do that? Or, or why do I kind of always fall into this pattern of behavior, right? Is this just coincidence or is this because men are expected to be a certain way. And especially if those patterns tend to, um, you know, privilege men and, um, you know, disadvantage women or, or people of, of non-male genders. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. I'm Andrew Brown reporting for Eye of the Eagle.
Goodwood Auditorium hosted a performance of Indian American actress Minita Gandhi's Motherland on November 15th. Organized by the university's own Professor Wilson Chen, the dark comedy focuses on themes of identity, spirituality, and sexuality over the course of an uninterrupted 90-minute performance. The event was sponsored by Benedict Ten University's Intercultural Education Committee, Campus Ministry, and many others. The show has made many stops during its run and was available here for a very limited amount of time. I of the Eagle, Zachary Dunn, spoke with event coordinator Wilson Chen to find out more. I'm Zachary Dunn with I of the Eagle, and I'm here with Professor Wilson Chen. Hi, glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you for speaking to me this evening. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, here we are at the Goodwin Auditorium, uh, who originally came up with the idea to bring this show here? I happened to see Motherland uh, a year or so ago and I talked to colleagues about it and folks sounded very excited about uh, hosting a performance like this and so we inquired with Manita Gandhi's agent and step by step we worked it out. We thought it would be a a real hit with our students, it would inspire them, it would move them, it would introduce them to a kind of theatrical performance that you typically don't see in the suburbs. Uh, if you live in the city, you have lots of access to these kinds of theaters, but out here in Lyle, not so much. So we formed a group and, and uh, what, six, seven different departments worked on this together. So it was a fun, collaborative uh, planning committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how long has this show been running? So she actually developed uh, Motherland at Silk Road Rising in downtown Chicago, and then it premiered um, in its final form at 16th Street Theater in Berwyn. And I think they had you know, mostly sold out shows in Berwyn, and that was this past year. And I think now she's traveling and performing it uh, in different places at different universities and different venues. So. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there was quite a diverse turnout in the audience here tonight. Was that expected or? Uh, I'm very committed to multicultural, culturally diverse programming. And my sense is that um, we have a diverse population. They're thirsty for that kind of programming. And so, sure, I did expect a very diverse audience. We also reached out to the community. There was uh, an interview that Manita Gandhi did uh, with Chicago Public Radio, so many listeners actually uh, contacted us afterward and ended up coming to the show. So I think, yeah, we got a lot of diversity from our campus, but also from the greater Chicago area, also from the Naperville community. So I, I think certainly that was one of our goals, yes. Mm -hmm. It was um, quite an intense performance, but I believe it was, uh, it was very well handled and it was very poignant in its message. Um, was there a bit of a risk in uh, pitching that to the uh, to the stagehands here, or the intensity of the performance? Right, right. Yeah, I, we 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 knew it was an intense performance. I had seen it before and, and was incredibly moved by it. Um, you laugh through many moments, but you also easily cry through other moments, and so it is a very emotionally intense experience. I think uh, good theater puts you through certain emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. We do have counselors on hand, uh, volunteers from the YWCA, because when you see trauma represented on the stage, it can tr trigger all kinds of memories and people's own traumas. Mm -hmm. So we um, mentioned at the conclusion of the play that we had uh, counselors outside in case someone wanted support uh, mm -hmm. leaving the play. And actually they, they were here for the whole uh, two hour period. So if someone had left and looked distressed, uh, certainly um, um, they would have been there to, you know, provide support. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to speak to me, Professor Chen, and sure. uh, Thank you. it was a wonderful performance. Thank you so much it for was. your time. And we hope to have more of this kind of programming at Benedictine. Tis the season for holiday spirit, and Benedictine is all over it. Thursday, before students went home for winter break, Benedictine hosted its annual family and friends Thanksgiving dinner in the Krause dining room. Despite the change in food services, the Krause staff didn't skip a beat. Many friends and families of the Benedictine community poured into the dining hall to enjoy themselves as the night carried on. Trey Pierce and I of the Eagle had a chance to speak to the director of foods. Here is what- Hi, I'm Trey Pierce and this is I of the Eagle and I'm here with- Bill Reich, food service director. 
Okay, hi. So we're here at the Thanksgiving dinner event, and I wanted to ask you, why did you guys choose to host this event tonight? Well, it's a rich tradition at Benedictine. It's been uh, taking place for 40 years, and we really wanted to continue that tradition and be a part of it and have some fun. So did you think that it was a good turnout tonight? Yes, it was an excellent turnout. So before I let you go, what is one thing that you're thankful for? Well, I'm primarily thankful for my family, um, all of those folks who are close to me. I'm also thankful for the Benedictine community because it's a great place to be and to work. Benedictine's Institute for Business Analytics and Visualization held its first ever hackathon on November 16th. Participants competed against one another by analyzing data sets through a program called Looker. Using the data, each group made their own conclusion about living in Chicago. A group called Big Data Energy came in first place with their presentation on how income affects people's desire to live in Chicago. A group called Big Data Energy came in first place with their presentation on how income affects people's desire to live in Chicago. Eye of the Eagles Bernadette Manalo spoke with Dr. Larissa Ademiak to learn more about the event. Uh, so Dr. Ademiak, um, what, why did you want to create this hackathon? The hackathon was actually recommended to us by one of our sponsors, Kibola. Mm -hmm. So we had met uh, with Leonard King over the uh, spring semester. We had taken a group of students to 1871, which is an incubator in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's an entrepreneurship space, and we had met, and we had started working on various projects over the summer, and he said, you know, hackathons are really great. They're really fun. They're very innovative. And so that just really launched the entire process. And can you tell me how the hackathon actually works? So a hackathon is a is a project that students get to work on throughout the entire weekend. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, a hackathons will involve either 36 hours or 48 hours, oh, and wow. students will spend the night. Uh, so this hackathon, we're doing over 20 hours, oh. and we're spreading it over three days. So the students will get training on the software, from the, which is provided by our uh, sponsors tonight. Then they'll have a full day work session uh, tomorrow. And then on Sunday, they'll have some morning time to finish up their project. And then we'll have our award ceremony Sunday afternoon. The project, we've uh, gotten data from the city of Chicago. So we've been working with them uh, quite closely. Uh, where the students are going to be putting together a desirability index for the various neighborhoods in Chicago to help determine which is the optimal neighborhood to live in. What do you hope students get out of participating in this event? I hope they get a love for learning about data and modeling. I also hope they just really learn to enjoy the process of modeling and coming together with their team and creating something that they didn't think was possible. And is this something that you plan to do in the future? We hope to. Yeah. yeah, we uh, hope to continue doing this. Um, we've got some ideas for maybe doing another one in the spring and working with uh, other various universities within the Chicagoland area. Thursday, November 29th, Theta Phi Alpha held their first fundraiser, Pi Theta Phi. During the event, students could pi members of Theta Phi Alpha for $1, professors for $2, and faculty members for $5. After the event, Gianna Toniello had a chance to speak with a member of Theta Phi, Alana Davis. Hi, I'm Gianna from Eye of the Eagle, and I'm here with Alana, a member of Theta Phi Alpha at the Pi, a Theta Phi event. Alana, can you tell me a little bit about this event? So this event we do every year for part of the sorority, and it's for today, it's to raise funds for the new chapter on campus. Did you have fun today? I did. It was really fun. It was my first time doing this Pi, a Theta Phi event since we are a new chapter, and kind of shocking at first, but once you got into it, it was a lot of fun. So you were a little nervous getting pied? Yeah. Oh, you were? It looks like you got pied. <laughs> yeah, I got, got pied pretty good. Yeah, I got pied pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's fun. It's all fun. And this event took place yesterday, too, as well, right? Yes, it did. Do you think this event is successful? Do you think people like this kind of event? Oh, I, I think it'll be a fun event for the campus, um, just to, for awareness of the sorority as well, to raise funds and charity as well. It'll be great for the sorority, great for the campus, good community aspect as well, getting to know more of the students and for the students to get to know us. 
do you like being a member of the sorority? This is the first sorority ever on campus. Mm -hmm. Do you like it? Are you having fun? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I am actually having a lot of fun right now. It is the first one on campus. So starting out, it's a little nerve wracking and a little hard just because we don't have a set blueprint of what to follow. Mm -hmm. But starting it out, we hopefully are going to make it a lot easier for you know any new coming chapters, any new sororities that want to come on campus. But it's fun and challenging at the same time. That's awesome. Are you excited for the events to come? I'm sure there's plenty of those in the I future. I am. So we will have more Pi Theta Phi events coming up, um, hopefully in the spring and next fall as well. And then we would have more events as well, more sisterhood events for the girls to get involved on campus. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Gianna from Eye of the Eagle. The fifth floor of Kidlin has a special Christmas showing this month. The Benedictine Nativity showing can be seen all month long. Eye of the Eagle reporter Dominic Chuchi got a chance to talk to two seniors. They shared their thoughts about the nativities and what Benedictine has done to the campus. Dominic Chuchi of Eye of the Eagle here with super senior Nick Wood. Nick, how do you like the Christmas decorations up here on the fifth floor? Well, Chuchi, I love them. I mean, they're decorated all over campus. They've done a great job. Uh, Endless colors or ornaments, just great. It looks great. There's a ton of beautiful nativity scenes, and the trees have a, have a bunch of great decorations. It is quite beautiful up here. Thank you, Zach. The hallways of Kindlin have been decorated with hundreds of posters that are for sale. These posters have been collected from different online sources, many coming from different countries across the world. Trey Pierce survived the Eagle had a chance to speak with Ross Robinson, the one-man shop himself. Hi, I'm Trey Pierce with Eye of the Eagle, and I'm here with... Oh, this is Ross Robinson. Hi, Ross. How are you today? Oh, just fine. Okay, so we've noticed that you've been coming here a lot um, to sell your posters. How long have you been coming to Benedictine? Well, we've been coming to universities all over America for 38 years, but the first time I came to Benedictine College, this building didn't exist. Is This is Kindley, right? Yes. Uh, they only had that gigantic old building that they that they blew up when they, because it was breaking apart and the plumbing wasn't working, so they destroyed it. But be, in the old days, that building had the hallways were too narrow to come here, so we they put me in the middle of the cafeteria. Hmm. Okay. okay, so I have another question for you. Where do you find all your posters to sell? Um, well, the posters come from 27 companies all over the world. Most of those companies have a catalog with about a thousand selections, but one company has 35,000 selections. We have tested everything out in the poster sale to discover what the hits are. And so what we have now are all the greatest hits in every single category in the world that we can get anyone to buy. The only things missing from this poster sale are pictures they don't make anymore and pictures that have been proven to be terrible sellers. Okay, Russ, thank you for your interview, and that's all we have. This oh. is Straight Pierce with Eye Eagle. Okay. Benedictine held the last commuter breakfast of the semester on November 28th. The commuter services host two events each month. The breakfast was catered by Avians, and commuters were given the opportunity to socialize and eat a free meal before finals begin. Reporter Jennifer Flores spoke to the president of commuter services, Marlene Elzebet, regarding how the event went overall and how to get involved in the club. I'm Jennifer Flores with Eye of the Eagle here with Marlene, who is the president of commuter student services. So Marlene, how do you choose what food that we have here today? Um, so we have the commuter meeting every once every month. And during that meeting, we decide on what we want to have. So before we had some pastries, um, this week we have our hash browns and we have um, French toast as well. We wanted to have some waffles. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that, but the hash browns are also great. Um, and they were kind enough to provide us with some syrup. So, um, How do you choose who uh, works alongside you? I know that for last... Um, the last event, it was the counseling center, and this event at ACE. Uh, do they tell you beforehand, or do you guys choose who comes next to you? Um, Katie, Katie Buell actually reaches out to a couple of people, um, and usually we get, she tries to reach out to different departments every time and see if they would be interested, and um, so Katie is the one that works with the different departments. 
Okay, and then how do pe how does someone go about getting involved in commuter services? That's a great question. It's also through Katie Buell. They just need to email her. Thank you so much. I'm Jennifer Flores from Eye of the Eagle. The 2018 Festival of Trees is being held in the Comachac Art Gallery. This year's festival will be made up of trees lit and decorated by prominent area professional artists and graphic designers, parishes, community groups, local high schools, Benedictine students, faculty, and staff on display from November 19th through December 21st in the Comachac Art Gallery. The plan for the future is to have the Festival of Trees as a campus-wide event instead of just inside the art gallery. That's the news for December. I'm Zachary Dunn. And I'm Zakira Majed. After the break, we'll have sports with Darren Cohen. And so, Darren, I understand that the women's basketball team is doing a great job this season. They're off to a wonderful start of a 5-1 and one record. We'll get back to that after this. Welcome to Aunt Diana's Old Fashioned Candy Makers. This small shop will satisfy even the biggest sweet tooth. At Aunt Diana's, we offer a wide variety of fudge treats, from chocolate-covered pretzels to chocolate-covered cookies. We have it all. With Halloween right around the corner, come in and try our world-class caramel apples. These are perfect for the kids' Halloween party. With sugar and sweets all in one place, not only will your kids love it, but you will too. The shelves are always filled with delights that your family will love. Visit our shop located one block east of the Riverside Water Tower. Happy Holidays! It's a cold one out there, but it's a hot one in sports. The Benedictine University's football team fell to Aurora University on November 3rd, 41-24 in their final home game. The Eagles stayed in the game with seven tackles from Frankie Ville, along with a school conference record of 18 receptions by Brandon Moore. But it wasn't enough to keep the Spartans from winning. I the Eagles' Tiffany Bush spoke with senior linebacker Frankie Ville about the team's mindset going into the emotional driven game. Hi, I'm Tiffany Bush with Eye of the Eagle. I'm here with Frankie Veal, a senior linebacker for the Benedictine University football team. Frankie, today was your senior day. What's your fondest memory you have playing football? Uh, I would have to say when I first started, you know, I came in in California, Pop Warner League. I ended up breaking my arm, and I never stopped playing after that. Like, that's how I knew, like, I really loved the sport. So it, like, really stuck with me, and that, every day, that, like, that memory sticks in my head. So... Um, today against Aurora, you played your biggest rival. Um, how do you prepare for such an emotionally intense game? Uh, you know, I just try to focus on my job, like what's ahead of me. I don't focus on them. I focus on what we're doing at the time. I don't want to focus on them because if I focus on them, the game's about them. I want it to be about us. So my biggest thing was, you know, make sure I'm prepared, make sure my team's prepared throughout the whole week and making sure we have the same mindset when we came in. So. We all hate these guys, you know, that's how it is. We all hate them, and the only thing we can do is prepare, you know, prepare mentally and physically for a battle, mm -hmm. so. Uh, last year during this game, there was a fight on the field. Is there any lingering animosity between the two teams? Oh yeah, oh, big time, big time. Ever since that last year, you know, that huge altercation, it just, it ruined a lot of seniors' opportunity last year. Like a lot of players, we unfortunately lost a lot of players because of it, you know, we fought for a couple guys back that, you know, you know, the AD actually helped us out with that. But besides that, it, it's, we hate these guys. That's all I can say. Like, they're our biggest rivals. It's like, it's us against them. And, you know, I know a couple of seniors, I know every Eagle feels the same way. Every sport feels the same way. Every time we go against them, volleyball, basketball, track, every time we see them in any sport, we just, we just hate them. We want to beat them. And, you know, we prepare for it, so. So going into your final game against CUC next Saturday, how do you plan on preparing for that? Since my last week, you know, I plan on having fun, you know. That's all I can do at this point. You know, I love everybody. I love my team. I love the coaching staff. But I know it's my last – it's literally my last week of football. And after that, it's over and it's real life hits. So I plan on making the most of it, make even more memories. And I plan on winning. That's a huge thing too. But, you know – but besides that, like, I plan on having fun, you know, enjoying my time. Every practice, I know running sucks and this sucks, but I know in the, at the end of the day, I'm going to miss it. Mm -hmm. I'm miss everything about it. <laughs> I was just thinking about it, you know, it gets me a little emotional. But, yeah, you know, see, you see, I, I, don't, I don't know, man. I just, ah. <laughs> this, it gets me a little emotional. So, you know, I try to smile through it, stay happy, stay positive. Mm -hmm. So that's my mindset. That's what I'm going to go through. That's how I'm going to end it this week. 
The Benedictine women's basketball team won their home opener on November 9th against Augustana College, 71-66. The Eagles led the entire game with a close fourth quarter against the Vikings. But Sophomore Allison Mikulski led the team with 19 points, and freshman Alex Fanning followed with 15 points, helping lead the team to victory. I, the Eagles, Elena Morrow, had a chance to talk with senior guard Casey Williams about the new team and the upcoming season. Hi, I'm Elena Morrow with I, the Eagle, joined alongside Casey Williams, senior guard for Benedictine basketball. Casey, you guys just got done with a great game. What are some of your expectations for this season? I really just um, look forward to like our team working together and like really getting a strong bond where we can like uh, get back on defense and help each other out on, like on the backside, get into plays faster, stuff like that. Like getting a really good strong bond on the court and also off the court, so our sideline is always cheering us on and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Your t your bench was crazy today. Um, so you guys got a bunch of freshmen this year. How have they been keeping up with college basketball? and the tempo of it. I mean, it's a lot of um, new stuff. It's it's hard for them, you can tell, but they're really like doing everything it takes to like get together. They're all like, they all get along when we're there. They all talk to the coaches when they need to. Um, they do study tables, stuff like that. There, there's so many of them, so it's almost a better thing because they have so many people to lean on and we're also there for them. I think even as seniors, we include all the freshmen. We make sure like we're all working together and like we're one core. Right, that's super important to be one as a team. Do you feel Coach Charlie's been doing a good job preparing them for on the court and college itself? Yes, I mean, we started out like practices slow so like it was just like high school all over again but then we'd add one thing and then we'd add another so it was like slowly learning the one thing is like our plays there's so many of them sometimes we have to like stay after and like help them but that's something that just like takes like muscle memory and stuff like right. that like you just start remembering what to do and when yeah. to do it but other than that I think yeah we've uh, prepared pretty well and yeah. hard well what are you most looking forward to this season well, we got our first win, so I'm looking forward to many, many more wins, and hopefully, like, let's go on a winning streak. Like, let's not lose. That's what I'm looking forward to, so it's fun. Well, thank you so much. I'm Elena Moore with Eye of the Eagle. The women's hosted North Central College on November 20th. This was the second home game, and they approved to a record of 4-1. and one. The team suffered their first loss at Hope College the previous game, and were looking to bounce back with a win. The team was very excited about having two home games in a row and the opportunity to open the season with a record of 5-1. and one. I, the Eagles' Bravo Barisha spoke with head coach Charles Avercamp about the game and the team's season. All right, so coming off the loss against Hope, uh, what are the keys to today's game, looking to bounce back and get back on a winning, winning track? Yeah, I thought our, our energy and effort was great against Hope. Hope obviously being ranked number three in the country, we knew it was going to be a tough test, and I thought we really responded well and, and gave ourselves a chance to win. Obviously looking today, you know, battle for down the road. Obviously North Central has a very, very good team. They've only played once this year, but have a really good group of returners and freshmen, and we're excited for the opportunity. Absolutely. And uh, a little bit of a rivalry here. You got uh, North Central College representing neighboring city, Naperville. We obviously represent Lyle. Does that add a little extra motivation to the games or do you approach each game similarly? Yeah, each game we obviously approach it similarly. Um, obviously their assistant coach coached with us the last couple years, so it gives kind of our players a little bit more of an edge. And I know they're excited to play against her and obviously we miss her here, but um, we're excited for the chance to play. Awesome. And then you got uh, two home games. You got this one next Saturday, IIT also at home. Uh, good opportunity. Uh, what is the mentality like in terms of uh, really getting the ball rolling early in the season for you and the players? Yeah, well, I think a big thing for us is this year, obviously, we need to get an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament. So every game is like a conference championship for us. So unlike most teams, we get 25 conference championship games, and we've kind of approached that every single day. It's like we have to be ready to go every single night in, night out, every single tip. And we have a lot of players who are stepping into new roles this year, and so they've uh, really embraced them, and I think they're going to keep getting better as the season goes along. All right, thank you so much, Coach. Good luck in today's game. All right, thank you very much. The men's basketball team took on North Central in their home opener on November 20th. Benedictine lost a hard-fought battle 60-74, to making them 0-4 overall and 0-1 in conference play. Junior Eric Griego grabbed 14 rebounds and scored 8 points. I spoke with junior guard Isaiah Gransberry about the defense in his home opener. 
Hi, I'm Darren Cohen here with Eye of the Eagle. I am here with the Benedictine's guard, Isaiah Gransberry. Isaiah, can you tell me a little bit about um, today's loss and what could have been different for today? Um, first off, North Central's just a good team, so it was hard uh, having to come in with a whole bunch of young guys trying to get them to buy in and get them to understand the situation that we're in. Uh, it's always tough to play in a rivalry game that early in the season, so we just got to make shots really next time. Football team hosted their second annual trivia night, a fundraiser to help the team travel to Florida during spring break for their opening season games. I, the Eagles, Chelsea Blair, spoke with head coach Kate Heinkamp about the event of the upcoming season for the Eagles. Hi, I'm Chelsea Blair here with Eye of the Eagles Sports. I'm standing here with women's softball coach Kate Heidkamp. Um, Kate, tonight you guys are having your annual trivia night. Could you tell me a little bit about your trivia night? Yeah, it's actually our second time ever. We've had a great turnout. You know what? We have really good families in our program. They have a great time. They spend a lot of money. They help get us to Florida, and it is a good time. So this is a fundraiser to get you guys to Florida? Yes. All right, and then you mentioned about having the players and their family. Mm -hmm. What's the best part of having both the players and their family all under one roof at the same time? First of all, it's something for our players to do together. It's fun, and of course we love involving the families whenever we can. That's the beauty of being a Division Three sports program is that we can do fun things like this with them because they can be a part of it. Yeah, okay, so your upcoming season this um, spring, what is the thing that you're like most excited for and looking forward to? Um, I, I'm excited to play. I'm excited to spend time with the girls every day. It's just the most wonderful thing. But we're really excited this year because we have 13 newcomers. So it'll just be, it's, it'll be brand new for all of us. And so it's always a new breath of fresh air and it'll be fun. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is Sports for December. I'm Darren Cohen. Happy holidays. Welcome back to In the Spotlight with your host, Bravo Barisha. Welcome back to In the Spotlight. We are joined with Brittany Dvorak. Um, we finished off the first segment talking about your work as uh, in admissions and as an events coordinator. Um, so tell us a little bit about what initially drew you to Benedictine. Well, when I was looking for uh, jobs, it was originally it was just a job kind of out of college, uh, starting and interested in um, working in higher education. Uh, so that's what kind of drew me into it originally was just one location, but then also um, I wanted to kind of pursue a higher education um, and eventually become an advisor. So, so it was kind of always like on your radar? Yeah, like yeah. once I kind of switched my major from education to go into communications, I always um, found it interesting working in higher ed and kind of the different areas that I could go into with my background. Absolutely. So um, after admissions and event coordinating, you obviously work in advising now. Um, what, what led to that? I always enjoyed my advisor girl, um, when I was in uh, college. She helped me immensely just because of when I changed my major, I had no idea. I thought that was my entire, what I wanted to do my entire life was education so when, um, and be a teacher. So when I decided to change, she helped me so much to kind of figure out what I wanted to do and I wanted to be able to provide that to students as well. What, do you, what would you say is your favorite thing about working in advising? Um, making sure, especially because I work with some undecided students too, to trying to help them what their passion is and what kind of clicks and that light bulb that goes off a lot of times when they're taking different classes, especially with some of the undecided students, making sure that they kind of, you know, figuring out what they want to do in that passion is always um, a good thing that I like to see. And then kind of um, the opposite of that, what would you say is the most difficult thing about working in advising? Um, let's see, students responding to emails or texts. Yeah. I would say that would be the difficult part. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it difficult um, dealing with students who are kind of undecided or are unsure about switching majors or what? No, I wouldn't say so. Um, it's more so just trying to figure out what they want to do. That's, I think, just kind of narrowing it down because especially if there's, a, if you're thinking like marketing or communications, you know, those are similar to a point, but there's still a lot of different classes you have to take so just trying to figure it out to make sure it all plugs in so you can graduate in a timely fashion. Right. Um, in terms of somebody who would be interested in doing advising um, as their career, what, what, what advice would you give them? I would say to definitely um, try and do, talk to your own advisors um, or talk to, um, and, and definitely do internships even too, see if you could do an internship in um, advising or um, just kind of look more into 
what it entails to be an advisor um, and making sure that you're definitely detail oriented because I think that's the biggest thing, organized and detail oriented. What would you say prepared you more for advising, your communications or your leadership? I would say both. Both. Um, communication definitely because you have to make sure that you're communicating effectively to uh, your students um, as well as the leadership. You want to make sure that you're um, the person that you know they know they can go to as well and making sure that you can effectively communicate everything to them and making sure that you have every you know have everything aligned um, to help them graduate and to make sure you know especially you know like going back to the undecideds right making sure that they realize that you're there for them with that um, information for them. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for right now. Brittany, thank you so much for being here. This has been In the Spotlight with your host, Bravo Brescia. Happy holidays and goodbye. Excuse me, sir. I the eagle. What's the uh, worst Christmas gift you ever received? What's the worst holiday gift you've ever received? Um, what's the worst Christmas gift you've ever received? Um, probably a lump of coal. Uh, probably a paper that said I O U. Hello, Tiffany Bush with the I the eagle. I have one question for you. What is the worst holiday gift you've ever received? Oh, a gift card to Best Buy. You don't like Best Buy? No. Why? Uh, they don't have any good stuff. Fair. Thank you. The worst Christmas? Uh, no gift, man. No gift? No. Nothing. He, he got nothing. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Socks? No, I like socks. Um, no, that's good too. A lot of bad ones, huh? <laughs> All right. Here comes, we're gonna get, what was the worst Christmas present you ever received from Frosty the Snow? Did you hear that? Wow, that was a really bad present. Socks. What kind of socks? Off-brand Target socks. The Christmas gift I've ever received is a pack of socks. And they wasn't even Nike, they was just no brand. I was like, what's going on with that? Like a pair of socks. <laughs> socks, socks for all. <laughs> An ugly Christmas sweater. A toothbrush. A toothbrush. Worst holiday gift. I've received alcohol as a Christmas gift, but I'm underage, so I can't even drink it. <laughs> uh, one year, my parents gave me a Bible for Christmas, and I still have yet to open that Bible. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything. All right, thank you. Yeah. I honestly don't have that good of a memory, so I couldn't tell you. Seven stops for Frankie. Whoa, let's go, okay. Campus Ministry and many others. The show has made many stops during its run and its availability here for a very limited amount of time. It's going so fast, oh my God. Dreaming of a white Christmas. Oh, I was the one you used to know. Spoke with Dr. Larissa Ad Ademe Ademiak to learn more about the event. Despite the change in food services, the crowds of staff didn't stop, didn't keep a 28th, 28th. There was a good turnout for the breakfast. The commuter services, you're making faces. It, are you, I could... Here we go. The show has had made many, sorry, sorry. One take Jake. Off to a great start. They're off to a wonderful start. They're off to a five and one start after <laughs> I said start twice. <laughs> They're off to a very <laughs> start. Full start of a five and one record. We'll get back to that after this. Why did you laugh?